Welcome to Woodland Valley Church. We're located in Mars, PA, and we are very glad that you've decided to join us today. I have a challenge for you, though. My challenge is that you would allow the Word of God and the Spirit of God to transform you. So let's dig into the Scriptures and see how He wants to impact your life and mine. This is Memorial Day weekend, and we do honor uh, fallen soldiers from the past that have uh, paid a, the ultimate price for our freedom to be able to come here today and to be able to worship and, uh, and adore uh, our King in spirit and in truth. And, and as I was thinking about that this week, it got me thinking about requirements, expectations, and uh, soldiers go into the military, well, boys go into the military and become soldiers, um, knowing what's expected of them. Uh, they're deployed uh, around the world, and they're told what the expectations are, and the expectations are you might not come back, you might not return home. And they know this before they go yet still they go. And, and that's kind of what I want to talk to you about today as we're, we're going through our series on what it means to be a community of believers, uh, like faith, the faith family of God. And we've been looking at some, some pretty uh, um, amazing benefits and amazing blessings that God showers upon us. But a lot of times what happens is you'll go to church and you know, you'll raise your hand, you'll get excited about something, and, and then you'll leave, and you're all kind of pumped up and warm and fuzzy for a while, and, and then you kind of get back into life, and you never know what the expectations are to be part of something uh, greater than you could possibly imagine. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about today. I, and, well, let me ask you, have you ever been in a situation where you were completely, utterly, laughably ill-prepared. I know probably every parent here is saying, oh, yeah, every day, nobody told me about this kid thing 24-7. How many of you knew having a child was a 24-7, 24-hour, seven-day-a-week job <laughs> ahead of time? You may have known it, but when you get hit by the reality of it, you think, wow, I don't know if I, I, don't know if I have the qualifications to be a parent. That's what they say. They say, you're qualified to be a parent when you are a, what is it? Grandparent. That's right. Um, and, and that's, you know, maybe, maybe you were given a job and uh, you didn't get a job description. Uh, expectations. You don't know what they are. You, you get out of that job and you, you don't know what you're supposed to do. Or, or maybe you take a college course. And I, I had one, one professor that, uh, he, every professor gave us a syllabus. And we took the syllabus, and we knew what was expected of us. One professor did not. It was my worst class. I hated the class because I didn't know what was expected of me. Uh, we, we need to know. Oh, well, how about this? Maybe you get a promotion, and you're in the same company, and your boss kind of just assumes you're going to know what to do, and you kind of get into that position, and you're thinking, okay, what do I do now? It's kind of a, a, a tough situation. And... and uh, maybe in that situation you failed miserably. Um, the problem was you were not given the details. You were not given the expectations up front. And, and you know, like I said, for the past few weeks we've been looking at God's dream for community and, and how we were made for more of him, more of each other, more of a family of faith, standing together and, 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 and living together and, and, and having a mission together. And, uh, it, and it's wonderful. Um, and community in God with each other is kind of a glimpse of heaven in some respects. But, yes, there is a but. Uh, what does God require of us as citizens of his divine kingdom? We really need to understand that. Because you see... No matter what you join, no matter what you become a part of, there are what? Expectations. There are responsibilities. There are dues, so to speak. There's, you're, you're not, you, know, you don't just go along for the ride. Uh, it seems in, in everywhere else in the world, but, but 
churches throughout the years have kind of fallen into that. Uh, I, I visited a church once, and um, the pastor said, everyone just sit back, relax. We want to serve you in every way possible, and we just want you to leave here full of goodness. I'll tell you what, at first I was like, hey, this is the place for me. They're going to they're gonna serve, you know, I'm, I'm looking around, where are the grapes and the, the big fan, you know? Come on, let's, 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 let's get this thing going. Don't, don't, just, don't just tease me with it. Let, let's, let's. And then I started thinking, wait a minute. Is that, is that what the church is supposed to be? Is the church supposed to be a place where you come once a week, get served, and then go out and continue to serve yourself? And I realized, no, it's absolutely not. Becoming part of God's family, God's kingdom, has with it certain expectations and responsibilities. And we're going we're gonna to talk about that. Look at Ecclesiastes 12, 13. This is after Solomon did this life experiment of, you know, what's the purpose of man? And he, and he concludes with this. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. In the Bible, fear is always connected. When fear is connected with God, it most always means reverential awe and worship and adoration. And it's that moment when you truly fear the Lord, when you truly are overcome by Him, it's that moment when you realize just who He is and how all-consuming His love is for you. And I know some of you experienced that. I know some of you have gotten to that point where you know, you're kind of going to church, you're kind of doing the, you know, you're reading your Bible and you're praying and, and it's all good and, and you, you know, you're happy about that and, it, and, and things are going pretty good. And then, but then there's that, that moment that ignites a deep desire within your soul to serve and to please the king of all kings. It happens. It happens to people who are truly sold out to God. They come and, and yeah, there's a period of time when there's, there's a growing and there's a, a learning and there's a, a, an absorbing and, and, and then all of a sudden you're hit with it and it grabs you by the soul and it won't let go. It's that moment when you think God is God. He is almighty. He is everything. And all I want to do with the rest of my life is serve him. I know some of you have experienced that. I know it for a fact because you, you've shared it with me. It's that moment that changes everything. When you go from being a spectator of the kingdom of God to becoming truly a citizen of the kingdom of God. And, and you have this overriding desire, passion, hunger in, 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 in the core of who you are to be what God wants you to be and to serve the king of all creation. It is an amazing, an amazing time. John 14, 21. Jesus said, Whosoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Here's the bottom line. Please get this. If you want more of God, simply give God more of you. Now, we're going to map that out today. I'm not saying, hey, everybody, get your checkbooks back out and write a bigger check, write another check. That's so small in the kingdom of God. I'm talking about us saying, Lord, <laughs> not just my checkbook, not just my car, not just my kids, not just my service, not just my praise and worship on Sunday morning, not just, but Lord, everything. I am completely yours. Do with me whatever you want. Plug me in any way you want. It's not about a bunch of rules. It's not about a bunch of this, that. I mean, we're going to talk about God's commandments. That's what we're talking about the next two weeks. But it's more than just, okay, what? Thou shalt not kill. Check that one off. I got it. No, no, no. It's about becoming citizens in the kingdom of God where there's only one king. And it's not you. And it's not me. It's Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to talk about. He says, he says, if you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. And that's where we step up. That's where the rubber meets the road. And we step up and we actually become 
what he's called us to become. In Exodus 19, that's where we are. You can turn there in your Bibles with me. In Exodus, well, actually, we'll be in Exodus 20. But in Exodus 19, we come to the foot of Mount Sinai where we see this ragtag group of frightened, grumbling, fugitive slaves. Now, remember, where did they spend the last 400 years? In Egypt, okay? Uh, they have no sense of identity, no clear knowledge of God. They're in chaos, ready to run back to Egypt at the first sign of trouble. And what does God do? God doesn't say, hey, when you wake up tomorrow outside of your tents, there's going to be a sword in front of everyone's tent. You're going to be okay. He doesn't do that. He doesn't manifest his his glorious angels all around them and say, see, you're okay. I'm going to take care of everything. He doesn't do that. Instead, he gives them their expectations, his expectations of what they're supposed to be as the community of of believers in the kingdom of God. And and, and that's what we're we're going to look like. He maps out His expectations for their citizenship. And we're going to go, you can follow along in your notes. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 20. The first one is to prioritize. We need to prioritize. As children of God, as citizens in the kingdom of God, we need to prioritize. That is, we need to, uh, God needs to be first in my life. And, and we see that in Exodus chapter 20, verses 2 and 3. It says, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You know, if we want to be pure, holy citizens in a pure, holy community, then God needs to be number one. Everything else needs to stand behind God. There's a line. The line forms to the left, and God is first. Okay, with this, with this, first, this first requirement here. Um, I remember reading about a painting by a German painter, uh, Adolf Menzel. I actually have a, 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 a reproduction of it right here. Can you guys, can you see that? I know it's kind of dark and, and, and fuzzy, but um, if you look at the, the painting, um, he, wanted to, he wanted to make this incredible painting for, for I want to make sure that, that I, I got, because I messed up as I was reading this, as I was doing the research, Frederick the Great, not Alexander the Great, Frederick the Great. Okay, every time I go over my notes, I say Alexander, and it's not Alexander, it's Frederick the Great. But, but you see, it's, a, it's a, a painting where he wanted to honor Frederick the Great, where Frederick the Great was meeting with his generals. So, he began by doing the background. You see the trees back there, some clouds, and, and then, he, then he started doing the, the, the generals. He saved the king for last. Okay, and he went into great detail on, on what the, the, the facial expressions, and I know it's hard to see because it's kind of, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a very good reproduction, but, but um, uh, there's a lot of detail, and, and he, but he stayed the king for last. He died before he finished it. You see that white spot? That's where the king was supposed to be. So here's this masterpiece without its centerpiece. It's no longer a masterpiece. That's what happens in our lives. People do the same thing. They concentrate on their career or they concentrate on uh, their, their own future or they concentrate on leisure or sports or this, that, and the other thing and they leave the king for last. And we end up without a masterpiece. We end up without a king. And that's not what God's saying here. We must not ever leave the king for last. He must be first, and everything else surrounds that. In the universe, what's the, um, how, how, do, how do things, do, do massive objects revolve around less massive objects or the other way around? The more massive the object, the, the, the things go around it. This, they, it's said that in the center of the multiverse, so to speak, there's, there's an incredible mass that everything's just kind of spinning around. Okay, it's drawing it. This is, this is what God is supposed to be in our lives. It's not supposed to be, hey, Lord, uh, I can fit you in on Sunday mornings and maybe once in a while on a Wednesday night, but, uh, you know, I'm kind of busy. God says, I need to be number one in every aspect of your life. I've had people say to me, yeah, yeah, I go to church, yeah, and I try to do the right thing with my family, but I work at a place where it's just, you, you, you got to cuss. If you don't cuss, you don't fit in. Ah. Uh, Obviously, God is not the center, not number one in your life, in everything. 
He's got to be number one in everything. When asked about the most important law in all of Scripture, Jesus said in Mark 12, 30, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. So Jesus, uh, uh, what he did was, he, he didn't change the commandment, he, he expounded upon it. He said, you know, he, he said, hey, by the way, you know that commandment that God said back in Exodus that you guys read all the time? Let me tell you what it really means. It means, Jesus needs, it means uh, God needs to be number one in everything. Heart, mind, soul, spirit, strength, everything. God must be number one in my heart. What does that mean? The heart is where your, your passions boil. It can be a very, very good thing. It can be a very, very dangerous thing. If God is number one in your heart, it's a very, very good thing. If he's not, that's when it becomes dangerous. Uh, It's what we crave for. It's what we hunger for. Colossians 3, 2 says this. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. So we ask ourselves the question, what does my heart hunger for? What do I want more than any? What's the, the, the heartbeat of my life? Is it my career? Is it my kids? Is it my wife? Is it my, uh, um, my leisure? Is it, is it what, whatever it is, that's your God. Whatever is the heartbeat of, whatever drives your heart, whatever passionately drives you the most, that's your God, according to Scripture. That's why God says, I need to be number one in your heart. I need to be the one that is beating in your chest. That's pa- your passion. Now, that, it, it, it gets directed in different ways. You know, we're passionately uh, loving God, so we serve uh, his children. We're passionately loving God, so we, we build an orphanage. We're passionately loving God, so we plant the that's all. That's good. We're passionately loving God, so we love our spouse. So we're passionately loving God, but he needs to be the center that drives everything else not the other way around. God needs to be the center, uh, needs to be number one in my heart. God also needs to be number one in my soul. The soul is the core of who you are, by the way. Psalm 84, verse 2 says this, My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. What the psalmist is saying is my very breath, the very beating of who I am, the very core of my existence is centered on, on God. Um, For you musicians, the concept here is this. Does God resonate? You know what resonate means? Musicians, you know what the word resonate. You ever ever, um, uh, hear a song and and you hum and you actually hit the right pitch and it it feels different? You ever ever do that? I rarely ever do because I have no talent. But once in a while it happens and it feels a little different. I think, whoa, you you know what I'm talking about, musicians, right? There's a song... And you hit the note, and the note matches the other notes, and all of a sudden, it just, it, it kind of feels a little funny. From, to me, it feels funny. To you, Marcy, it probably feels natural to you, but, you know, for me, it's like, whoa, what just happened? That's that resonance. It resonates. Does God resonate in your soul? Are you rightly related? Am I rightly related to the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords? Does my soul resonate with God? Uh, God also needs to be the center uh, or number one, uh, in my mind. The mind is the seat of reasoning and understanding, by the way. Colossians 3.10 says this, uh, put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. God does not want us to check our brains at the door. God gave you an incredible uh, uh, three-pound lump of flesh in your skull that is beyond your wildest imagination what it's capable of. We haven't even scratched the surface. And God says, hey, guess what? I want you to use that for me. I want to be the the consuming thought that's in that three-pound lump of flesh. Uh, I want to be the, 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 the brain waves. I want to be what's going on inside of that skull of yours. You know, it's, uh, studies show that you cannot fully concentrate on more than one thing at a time. Uh, how many of you, you've heard of multitasking? Yeah, it's a big thing. It was a big thing a few years ago. It hasn't become as big a thing. It's not as big a thing anymore because you really are incapable of complete multitasking, according to, to studies. You're able to do a couple of things at the same time, okay? 
according to studies, your mind cannot fully concentrate on more than one thing at a time. You can have different things going on. Ladies, you're much better at this than guys are. Your minds are much more mosaic. It's an incredible thing what God has done with a female mind. Able to, you know, different things uh, uh, here. Guys, we're compartmental, pre predominantly compartmental. And we're like, no, this is what I'm doing. Nothing in the universe exists except for this. Right? Guys, come on. Tell me. You got the, that's why we get the list. Right? The honeydew list. Hey, yeah, I know you need that done. I know the, 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 the kid's falling out of a tree, but I'm, I'm on my list here, honey. You know, I can't go over there and save him. God said, I, don't, I, I want to be first and foremost in your mind. I want to be what you're consumed with. And that's our question. Does God captivate my mind? You know what it's like when you were dating your sweetheart. You know what it was like. You couldn't get him or her out of your mind. Right? It was like, I wonder what she's doing now. Is she thinking about me? <laughs> right? I used to think that. I'm like, I wonder what Angela's doing. Right now. I, I, she's probably thinking about me because I'm thinking about her. And, you know, and, and then I realized I, I, I can't stop thinking about her. The neat thing is, and this is a little off track, just a tad, a husband and wife centered on God, that continues on for the rest of your life. So teenagers, that's an amazing thing. What you experience now, centered on God, continue. And you always think it, and it's an incredible thing. God says, that's good, but I want to be number one. I want to be the focal point of your mind. And God wants to be uh, first in the physical as well. Uh, it says here in Job, Job got it right, okay? Job 121 says, naked came out of my mother's womb, and naked I shall return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord had taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What's Job saying? Job saying, now Job lost everything. He was the wealthiest man of his day. Everything gone in a matter of hours. What does he say? He doesn't say, oh God, you were so unfair. His wife was kind of saying that and said, hey, why don't you curse God and die? Very supportive. <laughs> I bet anniversary that year was not a sweet one at the Job house, okay? Uh, but Job was, he said, basically, God owns it all anyway. All my stuff, my cattle, my houses, my this, my that, man. It, it belongs to him. Even I do. Remember God took away his health, even? And, and it was so bad that he was taking broken pieces of pottery and, 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 and breaking open the boils. And, 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 and it was a horrific time. And what does he say? Hey, it all belongs to God. Anyway, he can take it if he wants it. It belongs to him anyway. Huh. So we ask the question, is all that I have in my hands or his. Now, Brian prays often uh, concerning our time, our talent, and our treasure, and that's good. You know, all that we have belongs to him. My time, is, is my time uh, divvied out properly? Is my time centered on God? Is he, the, is he the, the focal point of what I do? Whether I'm at church or whether I'm at a Bible study or whether I'm at home or whether I'm at work, is God the focal point of, what I, uh, of my time? Okay, or well, my talents. Um, I happen to be in the back there, and she, she's going to get a little embarrassed about this, but I had heard that Allie sings well. And I hear that from a lot of people about different people. This person, I heard one person that sang well, and I listened to her thinking, I even sing better than this person. That's bad. So, but so I'm back there, and I'm saying, I, I need, you know, so I'm back there, and, and, I, and I heard a couple of notes come out of her mouth. I thought, wow, she really does. We got to get this girl doing something here and doing and, and use and, and that's what that's what that's how, that's what that's about your talents. Everybody is born. Uh, let me ask you this: How many of you have ever felt that you are uh, uh, maybe a talentless clod? Any of you ever feel that way? Come on, help me out here. My thank you, Neil. You backed me up there. You and I are the only ones with no talent in this building. Okay. <laughs> um, Every human being is born with between 500 and 800 natural abilities and talents. Didn't realize that, did you? Now, Neil, you and I are probably on the 500 end, but everybody else in here, 800 for sure, okay? God says, okay, I gave you these. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to use them for? Are you going to use them for me or for you? Treasure. Um, my resources, are they going to the kingdom of God or are they going to build my kingdom? God says, your physical, I gave it all to you. There was a, there's a, a little boy, a six-year-old boy named Tommy. I heard this uh, story one time. Uh, he became passionately focused on God. I thought, <laughs> six years old, really? 
And then I remembered, oh yeah, out of the mouth of babe, God's, babes, God perfected worship. Okay. Um, he had, he had this, this passionate focus on God and the love between them, and it became his reality. Okay. And uh, he was at, in the service one morning, and the, and the plate came by, the offering plate. And as he sees it coming down the aisle, he starts crying. Tears are, are running. He was, he was a street kid. He had no money. Tears are running down this poor little six-year-old boy's face. The plate comes to him, and he's looking at it, and he sees all kinds of denominations of money. He sees checks, and, and, and he's looking at it, and he's just crying his eyes out. And then something clicked, and he put it down. And he stepped into the plate. And the usher said, what are you doing? And this is, this is what little six-year-old Tommy said. He said, uh, through tears in his eyes, I don't have any money, so I give myself. And he went on to serve the Lord for the rest of his life. <laughs> I mean, think about that. He got it. He's like, every, uh, all he had was himself. But, he had, but what he did was he gave all of himself. Time, talent, treasure, all in one he just gave it to himself. Now, some of you, your feet are too big to step into the plate. So don't do that, okay? But, but think about that. God says, everything that you are and have belongs to me. So the first requirement for citizenship, citizenship is God must be first in our lives. So here's the question that we really ask ourselves. Is all of me centered on him? That's really the question here with this first command. Is all of me centered on him? If not, we're going to take a moment now. If you'd like to, I'm going to ask you all to bow your heads just for a second. Bow your heads, close your eyes. And I'm going to pray a prayer of commitment for myself and for this faith family as a whole. If you wish to join me, obviously if you're a part of this faith family, that's what we're doing right now. But maybe you personally want to take a moment to recommit. So that's what we're going to do right now. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I will admit you have not been first in my life in everything. I have faulted. I have failed. We are human, but we do not want to use that as, as an excuse it is a reality, but we don't want to use it as an excuse. So, Father, right here, right now, I personally recommit my life to you. I will strive to see you as number one in my life. Father, we as a faith family, we try hard. We surrender. But, Lord, we are human, and we have not always put you number one in what we do. As a faith family right now, Father, that is what we do. We recommit ourselves to you, to your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Prioritize. Who's number one? Second requirement of citizenship is to purge. It means I must do some house cleaning. The Hebrews came out of a polytheistic belief system, remember? Uh, the Egyptians had a little God for everything. They had a God for the Nile. They had the, a God for flies, for lice, for locusts. They had a God for uh, cattle and, and frogs and, and the sun, everything across the board. And actually, the ten plagues, part of what they were, the purpose was to destroy their perception of who God really is. They had these little gods, and, and, and God, you know, he, he systematically went right through and proved to them, there's only one God, and it's me, he says. Okay? So the first commandment we just looked at, God said he was to have first place. The second commandment, God tells us he's to have the only place. Now, the first commandment kind of set you up, kind of set them up. He said, yeah, I need to be first. I, want to, I am to be first. And, and, you know, I can see them thinking, you're God. Of course you should be first. And then the second commandment comes and says, oh, no, not only first, but I'm it. I'm it. Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 through 6 says this, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord, thy God, 
am a jealous God. Here's the bottom line. God, <laughs> now I want you to I, I, you, try to wrap your brain around this one for a second. God loves you so much. He's not willing to share you with anything or anyone. We look at this, we see God is jealous. Wait a minute. Isn't that kind of petty? Isn't that kind of small? On the contrary, there's not a man in this room. I guarantee if you are, if you are worth half your weight in salt, there's not a man in this room who's not jealous for his wife. Now, let me map that out. I'm not talking about, you know, you see your wife talking uh, to, the, to the mailman that comes by, so you, you jump in your truck and you run them off the road. No, I'm not talking about that. That's crazy stuff. It was not here today, going tomorrow, kind of wishy-washy, nice feeling. God says, no, it ties us together. I will share you with no one, he says. No one. As a matter of fact, when anything else comes into our life that shares the throne with God, we're cheating on God. Now, I know uh, some of you very, very well, and even the thought of cheating repulses you, and that's right and proper. And you think, you might be thinking, I, I don't cheat on God. I don't worship other idols or gods or anything like that. Well, I think Augustine put the whole concept of idolatry really, really well. I think I got it up here, yes. Idolatry is worshiping anything that ought to be used or using anything that ought to be worshiped. Man, that's good. Let, check, take, take a look at it. Idolatry, that means anything else sitting on the throne with God. Idolatry is, is, is worshiping anything, okay? He said, idolatry is worshiping anything that ought to be used, which basically is money, cars, houses, anything, anything, okay? Or using anything that ought to be worshipped, using God for your own ends. I come to church to network with people. I had a guy say that to me once. He's like, hey, pastor, really like your church, but I'm going somewhere else. I was like, wow, okay, what, what's going on? Well, there's a church down the road that's three times the size. I'm like, oh, well, okay, if that's what you're looking for. I said, uh, sorry to see you go. He said, yeah, I'm going to be able to network there a whole lot better than our church. I'm like, and you're telling me this? <laughs> you know, it was kind of bizarre. Um, using God, using, I mean, look at it. it. It's a great definition. Our idols today look very different than the idols of the Hebrews. Materialism, love of leisure, worship of self, family even, power, position. The list goes on and on. This is what our king says. Our king says, you don't need them. I'm enough. That's what it comes down to. That's what this command comes down to. God says, you know what? You don't need to have that stuff as, as, as the, the worship in your life, as the focal point of your life. Now, do we need to work and earn money and, and survive? Absolutely. In fact, the Bible says uh, that, that if, if you don't, if you don't provide for your family, you get a problem, okay? Do we, should we, uh, uh, do we need cars and houses? Do, do we need stuff? Do we need stuff? Do I need food? I, I, I you know, um, clothing and, and cars and, and career. Yeah, but they're tools in serving the kingdom of God. And God says, "I'm enough. You don't need to worship anything else. You don't need to be consumed with anything. I'm enough," He said. And that's the that's the second. Uh, well, take a look at uh, how Isaiah puts it. Isaiah 43, verse 11, says, I, even I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. In other verses, it says, there is no other. No other. There should be one God and one God only in our lives. He should be first and everything. So we've got to ask ourselves the, the question, is God enough? And only you can answer that. This is how you map that out in your head. Some of you are like me, you're picture mind. You need, you need something to kind of attach to it. Here's something. If God took everything that you had away but him, would that be enough? Now, flip it. If God gave you everything you wanted but he stepped out of your life completely, where would you be? That's terrifying. I'll tell you where you would be. You know where you would be? Anybody know? Anybody know the answer? This, this is not a trick question. If God took, God gave you everything you wanted, or you thought you wanted. But he stepped out. What would that be like? Four-letter word, a couple of hockey sticks at the end, hell. Because, 
Because hell is separation eternally from God. So if God gave you everything, now in hell you're not, people don't get everything, but if God gave you everything, but he stepped out of your life, that's like living in hell, according to the scriptures. But if God took everything out of your life and he was the focal point and the center of your life, guess what that is like? Another word, opposite area, heaven. That's right. Because God is the central figure of heaven. He wants to be the central figure of your life and of mine. So we've got to an- answer the question, is, is God enough? So we have to pro- prioritize. We are to purge. What else are we supposed to do? We are to praise. I must reverence the Lord. Let me ask you this question. How sacred is the name of God to you? How sacred is the name of Jesus in your house, in your life? How sacred? And I say the word sacred because that's what it is. Sacred, separated, clean, pure, holy, righteous, without spot, without blemish. How sacred is the name of our king to you? Look at Exodus 20, verse 7. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God uh, in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Reverence, respect, worship, awe, wonder, the humbling, the humbly, humble bowing of the knee to the one who is above all and beyond everyone. Psalm 29 verse 2 puts it this way. Give unto the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of what? Holiness. What a privilege. What an incredible honor. Look at how William Temple puts it. I love this quote. To worship is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God, to feed the mind with the truth of God, to purge the imagination by the beauty of God, to open the heart to the love of God, and to devote your will to the purpose of God. Wow. So what's he saying? What does it mean to worship God? What does it mean to reverence God? It means let everything in you crave and hunger and be captivated by who he is. That's what it means to reverence God, to praise God. Praising God isn't just singing a nice song and then let's, you know, let's, let's get on with the service because it's getting late. You know, it's Memorial Day weekend. We got picnics to go to. That's not worship. That's not praising. Uh, that's putting in your time. And God says, I don't need you to put in your time. I need you to love me and to worship to praise, and to reverence. <laughs> he is the Most High. He is the Ancient of Days. He is the Almighty Creator of heaven and earth. We must praise Him, worship Him, adore Him. <laughs> we must guard the sanctity of His holy name, a name that you and I will one day bear if we know Him as Lord and Savior. Uh, Revelation chapter 22, verse 4 says this, We will see His face, and His name shall be in their foreheads. You know what that means? That means one day in heaven, when we see each other, guess who we're going to see in the eyes of each other? Guess who we're going to see? We're going to see Christ. And we're going to meet each other. Chris, you and I, we're going to get to heaven, and we're going we're gonna to meet up. We're going to be like, I see him in your eyes. I see him in who you are. That's what it means by his name is written on us. I see him in you. That's the wonder, I, 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 I'm, I, get, I get just overcome by this thought. That's what it means to praise. That's what it means to worship him. Not singing a song or giving some money or, or putting in some time. That stuff has its place, but it's empty without true praise and worship of God, without your heart being in it. That's incredible. And that look that, 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 that uh, seeing each other, uh, seeing God in each other can start now. Because according to Scripture, we're already seated in, in the heavenlies with him. It can start now. We can begin seeing Christ in each other now. We don't have to. How, how many of you are excited about one day getting to heaven? We're in church, so everybody's going to put their hand up. So, everybody put your hand up. Yeah, That's the, the obligatory, put your hand up. Okay, we're all good. Now, I want you to think about it. You don't have to raise your hand this time, but think about it. How many of you are really and truly looking forward to it? I mean, you are consumed with the thought of one day being in the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Think about that. I was talking to my kids the other day, and I told them, I said, I said, I love you guys so much. But I'm consumed by the thought of being in the presence of God one day. 
consumed by it. Literally, on my thoughts, even when I'm being a bonehead, I'm thinking, when I'm in heaven, I'm not going to be a bonehead. I can't wait to get there. <laughs> even when I'm striking out, I'm thinking, in, in, in heaven, there's only grand slams. Even when I'm, even when I'm um, um, being selfish, I think, when I get in heaven, it's going to all be about him. And I, and I, and I consume by that. But guess what? God says, it can happen starting now. Starting now. We're citizens of heaven now. We can now be consumed by him. We can now be praising and worshiping him as the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. And I, I gave this definition of worship to, uh, to Veritas a few weeks ago. True worship and praise is to be consumed by God, to be captivated by God, to be conscious always of God incredible incredible how do we do that how can we tell how can you tell if you're like because it's not that's not something you can stoke up it's not something like i'm just gonna i'm just gonna think about god all day and i'm gonna stoke it up matter of fact i'm gonna i'm gonna write his name on my hand here so that every time i look at my hand i'll think about him eh. remember the pharisees tried that and it didn't really work for them a whole lot they kind of get bounced out okay how do we do that? Well, take a look at Micah chapter 4, verse 5. It says, For all people will walk everyone in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Amen. This is coming on the tail and, and, and surrounded by a praise and worship of the King of all kings. In other words, true worship and praise always produces a transformation in our lives. True worship and praise doesn't mean standing up here, uh, when the praise is given and singing really, really loud and then walking out and, and yelling really, really loud at the guy to cut you off on the road. That's, that's no. It's, it's, it's being consumed by, it's having our walk change. It's, it's thinking, okay, uh, God, you're the, you're the center, you're the only, and it's changing how I live, how I treat people, how I think about things, what's important to me. That's the worship of a life as opposed to the worships of a lip. Remember, God said, I don't want your lip service. I want your heart, who you are. So the third requirement for citizenship is reverence uh, to our king. And we need to ask ourselves, is God worthy of this kind of reverence? Only you can answer that for yourself. Now, biblically, we know he is worthy. But is he worthy in your life? Have you, have I stepped back and said, yeah, I'll take, I'll, take second base. I'll take second place every day of the week. God, you are worthy of all of my worship, all of my adoration, all of my reverence. You know that song I can only imagine? I love that song. I like thinking, yeah, when I come into your presence, what am I going to do? And then I think, whoa, I'm in your presence now. You're omnipresent. What am I going to do? What am I doing now? That song isn't just about when we get to heaven. That song should be, we should be living it out right now. And there are times when I'm so consumed by his presence that I, 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 nothing comes out. It's incredible. Is God worthy? Only you can answer that. The, for this week, the final one, that we'll look at the rest of them next week. The final one for this week is uh, uh, peace. Peace. I must rest and revive in the Lord. Exodus 20 uh, verse 8 through 11 says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt, do no, uh, shalt not do any work. For in six days the Lord hath made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and hallowed it or made it holy. God provided a pure holy day to pure holy citizens in a pure holy commun community. We're told to sanctify it or separate it. One day of the week for rest and revival in him. That's what the Sabbath is. The Sabbath isn't just, hey, I'm going to go lay on my hammock and just take a break for the rest of the day. No, it's being revived in him, being revived in who he is. I mean, have you ever experienced a revival in your life? If you haven't, you don't know what you're missing. What does a revival mean? It means that which looked like it was dead... All of a sudden, it's alive. 
And if you came to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you weren't revived, you were, you were regenerated, you, you were remade, okay? But now that we're walking with him, there are times in our lives where, you ever get tired in your walk with the Lord? I mean, think about that. You ever be like, you ever, man, I'm just exhausted. It's time to read my Bible. Oh, but I'm so tired. And then you read it and nothing happens. How many of you have ever read your Bible and nothing happened? Tell, be honest, right? I mean, I'm not going to, my hand's up too. I'm not going to say, ah, oh, sinners. Yeah, I'm not going to say, that, you know, pagans, Philistines over here. No, no, no. How many of you, I mean, how many of you have ever, and, and, and be careful for the wording. I'm not trying to say that you're dissing God. But how many of you have ever been tired while following God? It felt kind of lackadaisical, lackluster, kind of like there's no spark. There's nothing there. You need revival. If you're like that right now, you need to be revived. The way you do that is right here. He maps it out. He says, separate a day for me where you're resting. Now, rest is different for everybody, but, but where you're resting and you're focused on me and, and I will revive you, he says. Uh, and it's a gift from the hand of God. Uh, Mark 2, 27 says this, Jesus Said unto them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The legalists have tried to, to make the Sabbath just another rule or regulation. Uh, but the Hebrew word Sabbath literally means rest and revive. Recharge. That's what it means. I mean, there's an extended version of that. But the bottom line is rest, revive in me, he says. <laughs> he says, keep it holy. Remember, holy means separate for a special use. That means take one day out of seven, every seven, and rest and revive in the Lord. That's where revival begins. Take a look at Psalm 85, verse 6. Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? When's the last time you remember really rejoicing in God? If it's been a while, you need to be revived. If it was 20 minutes ago, great. You still need to be revived because we need to be doing it constantly, okay? Uh, many of you had a tough week, I'm sure. Maybe it's because of work, uh, school, maybe the children, maybe your marriage, whatever, whatever it is. Some of you had a tough week. And, and some of you may even be exhausted and at the end of your rope. And God says, let me revive you. Let me fire you back up. And I'm not talking about stoking up an emotional response. I'm talking about something way far deeper, something that is in the core of who you are. And he says, I want to touch that place deep down inside you and light it back up. Many of us go through life in, in kind of like one of these deals, right? You ever been in a boat? How many of you are getting seasick just thinking about this and watching me do this right now? I'm not trying to make you sick, but, but you ever been in a boat and it's kind of up and down? Some of us, our lives are like that and we're, yeah, God is great. And then, oh, I'm so tired. I'm so exhausted. I'm beat down. I can't even sense you, God. He says, I want to revive you. Take a look at Psalm 138, verse 7. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. No matter what's going on, God says, I'm ready. I'm right here. He says, I spoke the universe into existence. Certainly, I can light a fire in the core of who you are like that. <laughs> it means separating that day. Uh, Robert Coleman talks about revival uh, uh, this way. Uh, he says, revival is that sovereign work of God in which he visits his own people, restoring and releasing them into the fullness of his blessing. That's pretty good. That's really good. Is what God says. God comes to you and says, you had, you had a tough day, didn't you? Do you know that I love you? Do you know that I'm right here, he says? Do you know that I want to light you up? <laughs> That's the gift of the Sabbath. I define it this way. The Sabbath is a day separated specifically for us to get a glimpse of God. That's what it takes. I remember a couple years ago I went to... Um, I, I, I grew up 20 minutes from the ocean and um, loved the ocean. 
Uh, and uh, Angela and I have been out here for going on nine years now. Yeah. Kathy's like, really? You're that old? Yeah, it's true. You know, you've been here. We've put up with you that long. Yeah, you have, Kathy. You, know, you were part of that. Um, but I, 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 you know, love the ocean. So uh, a couple years ago, we took a trip uh, with, uh, with some friends out to North Carolina. We were going to spend, spend a couple days out there. And it was, I, I, those of you that know me, you know if, if the drive is longer than 10 minutes, it's too long. I don't like driving. It's like, ah, where do I got to go? What? I got to drive to Pittsburgh? I'm telling you, I'm not kidding. Well, how, much, how long, David, from here, Pittsburgh, 35 minutes? I'm like, 35 minutes? You know, and Dave will tell you, Dave, you want to drive? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Whenever we go anywhere, I'm like, hey, Dave, you, you, I, I, I even say, I'll buy lunch, buddy. You know? Now, he's on a special diet right now, so it's really good for me. I get the better part of the deal. But, but I'm like, Dave, you want to you drive? I, and so here we are, 14 hours, nonstop. Well, stopping for gas, okay, because we're following other people. They don't stop. 14 hours. And then, then we, we come around this bend and over the crest of a hill, and there was the ocean. And I was like, wow. 14 hours, gone. I was exhausted. I was like, oh, man, my backside hurts just from sitting in this position for so long. I just said backside from the pulpit. I'm sorry. I'm like, oh, man, I'm so tired. My eyes are like, you know, you, you get that road hypnotism. You know, you're like, Ugh. But then all of a sudden, I mean, we pulled into the place that we were staying at. We barely touched our feet on the ground, and I was into the ocean. Uh, clothes and everything. It didn't even matter. I think I made the mistake I had my phone on too, which was a bad thing. But everything else was good, okay? Everything changed when I got a glimpse of that ocean. God says, guess what? The Sabbath, that's what it is for your soul. It's where we get an opportunity to get a glimpse of God. And that revives who we are in the essence of who we are. And that is the fourth requirement for citizenship in heaven in the kingdom of God. And we ask the question, uh, are you being revived regularly, periodically, consistently? Are you consistently going before the King of kings and the Lord of lords and being revived? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads for a moment and close your eyes. We covered a lot of distance today. We took a little extra time because this is, these are, <laughs> There really was no safe place to stop here. Here's the bottom line. We're going to be citizens. We are. Those of us that know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior are citizens of a kingdom that's going to last forever with the central and most important uh, person being God himself. And these first four commandments, these first four expectations for a citizen of God have to do with him and how we relate to him. And maybe you came in here today, maybe you don't, you're thinking, ah, yeah, it's uh, great, but I don't know if I'm a part of what you're talking about, Pastor. I don't know if I'm going to end up in heaven forever. I don't know if that's you. My Bible says, today you can know. 1 John chapter 5 says, These things have I written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. You may know it. My Bible says, today is the day of salvation. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He maps it out very, very clear. Romans begins by saying, you know, all of sin that comes short of the glory of God. You, me, every human being who ever existed, sinners, we sin, we do things wrong, we've messed up. We have. God understands that. He knows that. He, he sees everything. Problem is, sin cannot exist in heaven at all. The Bible even goes on to say, the wages of sin is death. Spiritual death, spiritual separation from God forever. But God loves you way too much to let that happen. And he's made a way. 
John 3, 16, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. And if you walked in here today and you don't know that, or you haven't wrapped yourself around that, or you have not come to that point in your life where you're confident that you belong to God and that you will end up in heaven forever based on what he has done, if you are not at that place, my friend, now's the time. Don't wait. Don't put it off. Now's the time. You say, well, how? How do I do that? Well, if you call upon the name of the Lord, the Bible says you shall be saved. Calling upon the name of the Lord requires two things. Turning from our sins, which is repentance, and turning to him, which is surrender. And I want to help you do that right here, right now, this moment. You want to know for sure you have a home in heaven? From the core of who you are, you can pray right now, right where you are. He'll hear you. You can say, Lord, you can say this, you can say it right with me, but mean it. Lord, I am not perfect. I have sinned, and I am so sorry. Then you can say this. Lord, right now, as best as I know how, I turn from that sin. I turn to you, and I place my faith, my hope, and my trust in your risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, everyone's heads bowed, everyone's eyes are closed. My friends, it's not some magical thing. It's far greater than that. It's not some super weird thing. It's far greater. It's supernatural. Something, if you just came to that point and you turned from your sins and you turned and placed everything in the hands of God, you've become a child of the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords, according to John chapter 1, verse 12. And I would love to pray for you. I'm not going to make you jump up and down. I'm not going to make you come forward. As a matter of fact, I'm going to ask you all to keep your heads bowed just for another moment here. And if you just prayed that prayer with me, I would love to pray for you. I'm not going to do anything wacky, but I would love to keep you in my prayer throughout the week. You just prayed that prayer with me just now. Could you do me a favor with no one else looking around? Could you lift up your hand? You could put it right back down. I just need to see who you are just for a second. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, you are incredible. And Father, we come here before you today seeking to be your children, seeking to be citizens in your kingdom. And Lord, we know you already did all the work on the cross. But then you lay out what's required of us, not for salvation, but because of our salvation. So Father, I ask that you would help us to be the church, to be the citizens of heaven that you've called us to be. I ask that you would lay your hand upon each and every person here. We love you. We cherish you. We come to you in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.